Okay. So, I'm kind of curious about, I'm, I know I'm correct about initializing an array, and they make all my, is, are it, is the setter and the getter, or the accessor and mutator, in another case, is that supposed to be set up in a specific way, instead of just calling the variable set and get? Um, you have to call them set and get, and they should they should just do the thing that it says. Um, but let me see what what you're doing. So your client is not producing any output at all. Um, and we're going to talk about this ODP in detail in a minute. But I'm just kind of taking a a preview here on yours. Um, so you've got an array of integers. You construct it in your constructor, you initialize it to one, your setter works, your getter works. Yeah, your code looks perfect. So I'm going to say there's something about how you're assessing it. Maybe you're assessing the wrong file, or you didn't compile it, or something like that. Um, but the code itself looks fine. Um, hmm. Yeah, I got it. So let's let's um go ahead. Sorry, I wasn't here on Monday. Is there any easy way to set all of one to all of an array to a single value? Of uh, mentions here. Yeah, a for loop. Uh, I think I know what they're wrong. So I think I I, I said my main real two is real three. Ah, okay, good, good. I hope I didn't. I hope I didn't mess up the uh, previous one. Oh, uh, that's always possible, but no, probably not. Um. Because 303 is open right now, so it's 303 that's going to be be assessed. So, if I were to do uh, ODP on the previous line, like 302, it wouldn't count it anymore because it's past the due date? Yeah, 303 is already on Canvas, actually. I uploaded those. Um, but, but 302 is not uh, accessible anymore, correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah, once once um 303 opens, anything that you do with assess is going to get get credited to ODP 303. Whether whether you say you're assessing 302 or whatever, it's always going to go to 303. So yeah, you're fine. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll show them saying, like, I know I did this right. Yeah, yeah. No, the code looks perfect. All right, so let's um. Let's take a look at ODP 303. This is an ODP involving arrays, um, or, or if you like, we can talk about K-maps. Um, so um, you're writing a class named named um, a class, right? And it's um, going to contain a private array of integers, um, which I'm just calling data as as an example, right? So I'm going to say integer bracket bracket data, and this is like saying integer star data. It's saying, hey, this is a variable. It's going to be an array of ints, but it's not yet usable, right? This is a declaration, but we haven't actually created the array yet. We've simply stated our intention that, hey, we're going to have an array called data. But before we can use it, we have to actually create that array. This is like the difference between saying integer i and i equals something. The integer i is the declaration, the i equals something is actually giving it a value. So this is how we actually give data a value. And in this case, we're setting data to be an array of 10 integers. We're actually creating that array. We're allocating the memory, if you like and setting data equal to to that chunk of memory. So so arrays usually come in two steps. The first is is the declaration of the array um, and the second is the construction of the array. And we could do this in one line. We could say int bracket bracket data equals new int bracket 10. That's fine. Yeah, I think I did with someone said in chat where um, the way you can initialize an array of, well, what does it say, all ones, mm -hmm. is that you, instead of saying, you can say data equals new and with empty brackets, yeah, and then put in curly brackets, 
of the element in that array. Mm -hmm. Right, which you can also do in C. But it's, it's possibly easier to write a for loop, because you know how to do for loops. Um, the difference is, if you put it in curly brackets, the initialization happens at compile time, I believe. Um, as opposed to taking the CPU time in the beginning of execution to run a for loop. Um, but you know, my, my usual adage is simpler is better. Um, so that's why I suggest a for loop, but either way is perfectly fine. Um, all right. So your class, a class, um, the constructor should initialize this array so that each element is equal to one. So just set each element equal to one uh, for loop or, you know, declaration um, either way. And then you want two public methods, an, an accessor and a mutator. So the mutator, the setter, right, is a method called set. And normally, you know, this would be called set data or something like that. But we're just making a method called set. And it takes two arguments, an index and a value. And it sets the index element of the array equal to that value. So if you pass an index of three, it'll set element three of your integer array to whatever value you specify. So it lets you load values into the array and then get takes an index and returns the value of that element from your array. So an example of a main program that, that could use these, here I construct a new A class. Here I set element five to 17 and I set element eight to a value of 12. And then if I say, show me what the value of element five is, it should come back with a 17, because that's what I set it to. If I ask for the value of element eight, it should come back with a 12, because that's what I set it to. If I were to ask here for the value of element nine, it should come back with a one. Why? Because the constructor initializes everything in my array to be a one. So yeah, in, in, uh, in C, we would say in star, we definitely don't do that in Java. See you later. We definitely don't do stars in Java like that. So no pointers per se in Java. Um, in bracket bracket is, is sort of the analog to that. So go ahead and write your A class, test it out, you know, maybe with this main program, maybe with a main program of your own choosing, make sure the initialization is working also. Um, compile it like that. When you're convinced your program works, you can assess it by saying assess. Here's the test bed slash temp slash my main 303. And here's the, the source code for your class. Um, run the G command and, and go for 10 out of 10. All right, questions about that? All right, um, questions about PA2? Oh, okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So let's say, let's say, um, let's say you're processing your file and you find this word, right? So there's no spaces in here. There's a space before and a space after. So you find this thing in the middle of the file, right? First thing you do is you pass it to cleanup word, 
And what should come back in this case would be A, B, C, D, E. So, so the comma, the exclamation mark, the equal sign, the plus sign, those get ignored. And so in your for loop inside cleanup word, you, you grab the A, that's a letter, put that on your output. Take the B, that's a letter, put it on your output. Not a letter, skip, 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 skip. There's a letter, append it to your output. And so, so one way to do this is, you know, start off with a string. I'll call it output, set that equal to blank. Um, and then for i equals zero to, you know, whatever, if character i is a letter, then output equals output plus character i. So just keep appending the characters that you want to keep to your output string and then at the end of all of this return output. And this, this is something that we'll encounter fairly frequently when we deal with strings, a sort of building up an output string. You may have done this in, in a two-string method if you iterate it over the elements of the linked list, just keep tacking things onto the end of this string. And in the in the programming assignment, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I started looking at this program assignment yesterday. Um, and I started to look at it. It mentions the class of the constructor which constructs itself. Where's that? In the details of it, it mentions the class should have a single constructor, indexer and the equals new indexer. But I don't want my class to construct itself. No, this is an example of using that constructor. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's all. I guess the word is kind of confusing because it mentions it should have a constructor that the class should, and then... Uh, okay. So there, there is a constructor for the class, um, and and the constructor is, is definitely going to be called indexer. But no, this statement is not is not something you would find inside the class, because that would blow up your machine, probably. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. I was, I, was, I was kind of confused on that. Sorry, yeah, that is, that is bizarre wording. When I made that constructor into the indexer class, I basically just made a yeah, constructor with nothing inside of it mm -hmm. for some reason. Yeah. But is that what it's supposed to do? Because what's the point of making a constructor that does nothing? There really isn't a point, and you don't actually have to write a constructor explicitly. There's a default constructor, which you can call with no arguments, and it creates an index. So you don't actually have to do anything for this part. But if you want to write, you know, an empty constructor, public indexer, paren, paren, curly bracket, close curly bracket, that's legit. And then if there was something you wanted to do in the constructor, right, you've got a place to put it in right there. But since the constructor doesn't do anything in particular, you don't have to actually write it. You can just take the default one. So it's up to you. So in, in this implementation section, when I talk about cleanup word, I mention character at, right, which is a, a um, instance method in the string class that you can use to get the nth character from a string. So to, to do this business of, you know, get character i, you could simply say, you know, if your input is word, you could say word dot character at parentheses i and that'll give you the ith the ith character and you can tell if it's a letter or not by using this character dot is letter method yeah, that's kind of weird because I'm used to using like treating a string as an array of characters yeah which we don't get to do here yeah that's right now now, now you could turn the string into an array, but why would you do that, right? 
since we have a, a character at method available to us, um, that's the easiest way. You could turn it into an array and then read the ith element, but now you're going through a big long process of allocating memory, moving things into that allocated memory, doing some integer arithmetic to calculate that position, and then you're going to throw that array away, right? And it's just it's just kind of a lot of busy work for the the machine when in fact you could just say give me the character at this index position. And so this is this is probably the way you want to go. There's also a method in here called to uppercase. And to uppercase will return an uppercase version of a string. So if I've I've got my my cleanup word method and I'm taking in something like word, right? What I can do up here in the beginning is I can say word equals word dot to uppercase. Right. This runs the two uppercase method on this object, which is a string. The return from this will be the uppercase version of Word, and I can stick that in Word. Well, that turns my whole string into an uppercase string. So now, if you know this was a little a and a little e, they would turn into uppercase a and e, and I'm I'm done with the case conversion part. And then go through each character, and if the character is a letter, append it to your output. And, and, you know, we can be as sort of wordy or as verbose as we want. So I could do something like, you know, character C equals word character at I. If character dot is letter C. Then I could say output equals output plus C. So that does this business of if character I is a letter, append it to your output string. I could also do if character dot is letter parentheses word dot character at i output equals output plus word dot character at i and I'm I'm avoiding the use of a temporary variable is that good or bad? I don't know. I mean, in some sense, I'm doing more work here because I'm calling character at twice, but I'm eliminating a variable. I could say if character dot is letter C equals equals true, but that's that's needless because this is a boolean, and asking if this is equal to true is going to have exactly the same truth value as this boolean expression itself. So we we don't really want to know is is letter equal to true? We really want to know is C a letter, right? And so so eventually character dot is letter C becomes, you know, the thing we want to check for. If character is letter C, if C is a letter, then go ahead and do something. So there's lots of, of details in how you can you can implement this, right? Um, and it's it's personal personal style, personal taste. Do what, what makes sense to you. Do what feels like, like a good thing to do. But that's that's the basic pieces, right? So this this two uppercase to make things uppercase. Character dot is letter to see if something is a character and character at as a string method to pull off the the ith character in this case. And put that together in, in a way that makes sense. Talk about the add reference because I think the biggest problem I have is is when you're trying to implement a new um, word into a hash table, you also have to include a a 
Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering uh, how I can do that because I kind of put my idea down where I say, like, you know, my house table got put and I put in the word and then I put in a number, but it's, it's not expecting a number, it's expecting like a length list. Yes. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, how, you, how we can implement that. All right, so our add reference method. So it takes in a word and a position. This is a string, this is an integer. All right, so, so we can do the following pseudocode. If word is in the hash table, Use the get method from that hash table to retrieve the linked list associated with that word. Right, so let's let's be polite about this. So we have a get method available. We can put in a word, we'll get back a value which for us is going to be a linked list and the linked list class has an add method which says append the specified element to the end of the list so if we if we find that the word is in the hash table in other words we call get and it doesn't come back null right set list equal to that and then we can say list dot add position and that appends this number to the end of the linked list associated with this word. Otherwise, make a new linked list Add the position to the end of the linked list. Well, it's an empty list to start, so now we've got a list containing just that number. And then we're going to say, put that into our hash table. So put in, associated with that word, this linked list. And that adds it to the hash table, and now you've got an entry associated with this word, which is a linked list containing one thing, which is the position of that word. The next time you find the word, you'll say, is that word in the hash table? Yes, it is. I'll use get to get that list out of the hash table. That will give me back this list that I created here. And when I add something, it will add it to the end of the list. So it'll come after whatever position I, I put in for that first reference. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this comes to another question. Uh, when we're trying to visualize the hash map with like, you know, hash map and then whatever variables they're using and then not variables but like type mm -hmm. rather um what's a variable of your choice um i put down like hash map string and linked list integer mm -hmm. i can initialize the linked list integer before so that way i can access it if i'm manipulating it into the add reference yeah so so you're going to make a new hash map The key values are strings. The value values or the data values are linked lists of type integer. And so so you're telling the the system, okay, I'm going to have a hash map. I have a hash map. The keys will be strings, the values will be linked lists of integers. Initially, the hash map is empty. There's no data in there. If I say get any, any string, it's going to come back null. But when I add something to it, right, what I should add is a word and a linked list. It's got to be a linked list that exists. It, it, it shouldn't be just a null linked list. So before you add something to your hash map, right, construct the linked list maybe set up the value there if you want or leave it as an empty linked list 
and then in your put method for the hash map, you put in the string that's the word you want to you want to reference, and you put in that linked list object. And I could do this this add afterwards if I wanted. That would be fine. And so if if I if I wrote this and then I stepped back and looked at it, I would probably restructure it. This is just personal taste, right? I would restructure it because hey, you know, this is the case where the words are already in the hash table. What do, what do I want to do? Get the linked list, add something to the end. Here's the case where the words not in the hash table. Well, I want to add it to the hash table. But once I've added it, then I could still do these things. So I might restructure this differently, which would be um, something like, you know, if the word is not in hash table, list is a new empty linked list. Go ahead and put that into my hash table. So put an empty linked list associated with the word. So that's one block of if code. It's one set of curly brackets. It's indented once. And this stuff happens or it doesn't happen. And now I'm back to my main level of indenting. And I'm not going to put an else. I'm not going to put another if. Nothing like that. All I'm going to do is put a comment here. And I'm going to say, we know word is in the hash update its linked list and so now I can say list equals get word list dot add position and and to me right so let, let me go ahead and put that in list equals you know get word list dot add position. Okay, why do I like this? This this makes me feel very settled inside, right? All all coders have some degree of OCD usually. Well, I think everybody has some degree of OCD, but you find a higher level sometimes in coders more often than not. This puts me very much at peace, right? Because this chunk of code I completely understand. Get the linked list associated with the word, add something to it. But I've got this special condition where maybe the word's not in my list to begin with. Maybe it's the first time I've seen the word. Well, I dispense with that case up here. And what this does is it simply says, hey, if the word's not in the hash table, put it in there. Right? And now I have a second set of code which says, hey, find the list associated with that word, tack something onto the end of it. And structurally, you know, I don't have an else. I don't have... have um, you know, these other indenting levels to deal with complications and so on and so forth. And and the difference is, you know, if I do it like this, I make my list, I stick my thing on the end, and then I put that into my hash, and then I say continue or exit or return or something, you know. Here, I just do a, a preliminary step, if this is the first time I've seen the word, set up the hash table so that now I can do the same thing, whether it's the first occurrence or the tenth occurrence, just grab the list from the hash and then use the add method. Different styles, different approaches, neither is is better or worse in any kind of, of objective way. It's purely personal taste. Um, Question. Yeah. So this process file method, it creates a hash map of linked lists and the inside of the linked lists are indexes. So the index is just the number of words or the line is on, or it's the word position starting with one. Starting so, with one. yeah, so if this is this is a test, this should be indexed to position one, two, three, four. Okay, and then the next word, say on the next line, this is a, say we add another line, that'd be index five. This is index five, this is index six. And, and the reason this is happening is because when we use the, the next method from scanner, right, here's what your input actually looks like. This space is space, a space, 
test, new line, test, space, ha. Huh. Well, spaces, new lines, tab, collections of spaces, those are all considered delimiters between tokens. And so, so the scanner just sees token, 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 right? It doesn't necessarily see this as being on a separate line, unless you're saying next line or has next line. So it just sees white space between here and here, and it just keeps pulling in these things one token at a time. So yeah, we're just counting as position in this long string of things separated by spaces. I see. Okay. Why do we call it white space? Because that's what it is on paper. Yeah, because that's what it is on paper if your paper is white. That's going to be lost someday. Because we'll probably not write on paper at some point. And people will be like, why is it white space? It's like, why is it a dial tone? You know, what's it got to do with a dial? Uh, so. I, I, I don't think that's going to be uh, uh, the case for a long, long time. I hope not. I mean, I love trees, and hopefully we'll have, you know, synthetic paper. But I love writing with, with an instrument on a surface. Oh, empty sign. Nice. Got to love the German language. It's like... Very logical. And you get to come up with these amazing, like, 20-syllable words because that's what you're trying to say. I'd like to learn that language. All right, so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's basically the, the gist of ad reference, right? And either one of these will get you there. But again, you know, whichever way you approach it, you're really not doing too much work, right? This is just calling a method. That's how you pull something out of the hash. Pull something out and see if it's equal to null. That's how you tell if something is in the hash. Because in, in the hash map documentation, right, it'll tell you that when you say get, um, it'll return null if the map contains no mapping for the key. And so null in Java is N-U-L-L, -L, all lowercase, and that, that will um, that'll tell you if you've got this thing stored in your hash or not. Adding to the end of a linked list, it's just the add method, right? And then storing something in the hash is just a put method on the hash table object, and you pass the word and the linked list you want to store. Question? Yeah. I mentioned the position counter being not one, like you mentioned. Um, for... I, d I didn't mean to make this confusing, but, um, but it is. So, so on my loop here, I said initialize the position counter to zero, and when you're ready to store a word, increment the position counter first, and then call add reference. So the first word you ever store is going to be stored with a position counter of one. Oh, okay. The thing that makes it even extra confusing, which was not my intent, is that this location of, where I asked for an instance number, these instance numbers start from zero. So the first occurrence of the word hello, right, I would say location of hello comma zero. And that's just the usual index zero. And that, that helps you because um, when you try to pull out the nth occurrence of something from a linked list, that's indexed from zero. And there's, there's a method in the linked list class that'll work exactly um, the way you want, assuming you want the first instance with index zero and so on. And the business of numbering these words, that was just kind of a nod to, to you know, being human beings where we, we usually start counting from one. And since the question of, you know, what's the position of this, what's of this word in, in our file, well, as humans, we would usually say this is, you know, word one, two, three, four, five, six. Unless we're super geeky computer scientists writing textbooks and and trying to be clever and we'd you know start with chapter zero or something like that so that's that's why this starts from one everything else starts from zero but it ends up making it more complicated and and i hadn't thought about that so so we got to live with that all right if that doesn't make sense just keep asking Say that one more time? Maybe? Sure. 
I can say it as many times as it takes because it really is it really is a little bizarre. So when when we're making our index, right, I want to start counting from one. So I would say this is at location one. Is is at location two. Test is at locations four and five, and so on, right? So that's just kind of our human centric. You know, the first page of our book is page one. Right, the first position of our the first word is word one, two, three, four, five, six. But there's this one this one thing I did where I said, okay, I want a method called location of, which I can take an instance number and tell me the position of you know that instance of the word. Well, for this method, right, the first occurrence is instance zero, the second occurrence is instance one, and so on. So if I say location of test comma zero I should get back the position of the first occurrence of test which is a four if I say location of test comma one that should give me the value of five so element zero from the linked list element one from the linked list and so on and so forth And that's that's what you want me to ask you to do because there's this method in the linked list called get that takes an index. And guess what? That index starts from zero, right? So so this location of is really just a wrapper around um right, how do we do this? Go into your hash table for this word, find the linked list associated with it. If the list is null, the word's not in there, so return minus one. Otherwise, just do link list dot get instance number. Right? But if the instance number is smaller than zero, or if it's bigger than or equal to the size of the link list, so you know list dot size, then return minus one. Otherwise return, you know, list dot get parentheses instance num. So don't don't do any more work than than needed. Which which method is this? Uh, the first boolean. Um, on a, the first boolean um, contains key. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, you can you can say um, you know hash table dot contains key. Give it a word in this case, and it'll come back true or false. So that's that's how we can do this business of you know if the word is in the hash table, it's one method call. Awesome. Yeah. The uh, string to string on the hash map. How do you want that done? Um, on the last assignment, I did did a two string and got and lost points. I think because you wanted me to do it manually. I'm not quite sure. Um. Let me. No, I want you to do it the the easiest way possible. Um, which would be just to return the two string methods return from the hash map object itself. So if your hash map is called index, you really just need to return index dot two string and you should be good. But let me see what you did. Um, Yeah, your two strings look perfect because you just returns q dot two string or stack dot two string. That's fine. I think I just didn't end up actually using it in my main program. Interesting. Ah, uh, ah, uh, okay. Um. 
Oh, I see. Okay. So, so, yeah. Um, do you want to talk about it now, or do you want to do it offline? No, I think I know what I mean. Okay, cool. All right. Um, let's see. So yeah, hash map is is a super duper powerful fun class to use, right? And it's handling all of of the underlying complexity of of a hash function and collision and you know even things like rehashing to grow the table and monitoring how full the table is, which is, you know, roughly how many collisions you're going to get and and taking care of all of that for you. And you just get this this great set of of um, you know methods to interact with it, um, and let me let me mention that there is also a hash table class, which looks very similar, right? Um, it takes a key value pair, and it's got you know a get method that that lets us you know get an entry from a key. It lets us um, put things in with keys and values and so on and so forth. Um, and it's it's an extension of a dictionary, whereas a hash map is an extensionary extension of an abstract map. Um, so so in the top of hash map it says um, the hash map class is roughly equivalent to hash table. Two big differences though. The, um, the first difference is that it's unsynchronized. We'll talk about that in a minute. The second difference is, does it permit nulls? And so um, the question of can a, um, can a key or a value be null? Well, with a hash table, these can be null. Uh, sorry, these have to be non-null. Um, I don't remember which one is which. Well, there's some there's some difference there. Um, one of them allows null um, values, I believe, data values, and the other does not. Um, but the bigger difference has to do with um, synchronization, and this is this is part of a larger topic that we'll get into later on in the course when we start working with with multi-threaded um, applications where you have multiple processes running simultaneously. But the basic, the basic concept is a lot of these classes, up in the very beginning of the description, you'll see some, some reference to um, synchronization. And so on the top of the, the hash map, there's this bold case statement, this implementation is not synchronized. So this has to do with what's called thread safety. So in Java, a thread is, is what we call a process. And it's very easy in Java to create multiple threads or multiple processes that are running more or less simultaneously. And simultaneous processes get very interesting when they access the same objects. And we'll, we'll see some specific examples where this can cause some surprising problems, but let me let me give you a a kind of less surprising example. Um, let's think about linked lists, and let's think about our implementation of linked lists in two twenty two. So we had a node pointing to another node, pointing to another node, and so on. And if we wanted to do something like you know add up the value of all the integers in this list. We would, you know, start with this node, we'd add the data value to a running sum, and then we'd, we'd take the next value, you know, the next field, and we'd set temp equal to that, and then we'd say, you know, temp arrow data, let's add that to our sum, and then set temp equal to temp arrow next. And we'd keep doing that until temp was equal to null. All right, so suppose we have a list like this, and we've got a piece of code, and we're about to do this business of adding up the values of each data field. And suppose we have a second process running, which is going to delete this node 
from the list. All right, well, our first code, you know, says sum equals sum plus temp arrow data. And then it says temp equals temp arrow next. So this is our first value of temp. And now we say temp equals temp arrow next. So now temp is pointing to this node. And suppose at this point, this process goes out of context. The CPU stops executing this and it brings in a new thread. And that thread is deleting this node from the list. So it's going to change this node to point over there. And it's going to release this to memory. And when it releases it to memory, maybe it's going to set the pointer equal to next and the data field equal to zero. And now we come back to our first, um, our first process, which had temp pointing to this node. And we're going to say sum equals sum plus temp arrow data. So it's going to add a zero to our list. And then it's going to say temp equals temp arrow next, which means temp equals null. And it thinks it's done. And these values are not going to get added to the list. And maybe this is, you know, a linked list of current ask prices on a stock. And we've just lost, you know, a thousand prices. And now we think the stock is worth a few pennies instead of a few hundred dollars. And our system sounds an alert and it starts dumping all of our shares of this stock. And our company just sold all of its stock in Apple. And now we're bankrupt because, you know, we just lost a ton of money. Um, so, so this can happen really easily, right? When you have two different processes accessing the same object, you've got to be really careful that those things cooperate with each other. And as we get into, you know, more complex uh, coding where we have data structures, um, the, the penalty for, for not synchronizing the behavior of, you know, sharing an ac access to an object can become really convoluted. And, and these are the kinds of problems that are really hard to catch sometimes. And a pretty typical scenario is, you know, you're building a system that has multiple processes and they're sharing, you know, a hash table, which is where your database is. And you're trying to be careful that, you know, if somebody's deleting something from the database, something else doesn't get caught up by that. Or if two processes are adding to the database, both of those things get added and you don't have one, you know, overwriting the other. And so you write this very carefully and you test it and you run it on a simulation where you have, you know, 10 processes running at once and everything looks great, right? And so now you deploy this to the field and this is running the back end of your web server and it works great and you've got a fantastic project and and people are excited about it and all of a sudden one day there's you know 20 million people accessing your server at the same time and you have 20 million processes trying to share access to this object if there is any error in how you're doing that that's when it pops up right and it pops up exactly at the worst possible time which is when you have you know millions of customers trying to interact with your system and suddenly there's a null pointer exception and it seg faults and your your web server exits and now nobody can access your page so so concurrency multi-processing synchronization thread safety resource contention deadlock live lock these are all things we're going to talk about later in the course and it's it's a wonderful and terrifying area of computer science and, you know, it's been studied for, for, you know, 70 some years at this point. And Java does a pretty good job of making it pretty easy to, to deal with this. Um, dealing with it efficiently is a different matter. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's a preview of coming attractions. But in most of these classes, if you see something that says this implementation is not synchronized, it means if you use this, in a context where multiple uh, processes or threads might be accessing the same, in this case, hash map, you could get into trouble unless you do something to prevent that. So we'll get to that probably around week six or seven. Um, and we'll play around with that and we'll actually have some good fun with it. Um, 
So linked lists are another example where um, these are not thread safe by themselves, not synchronized. Now for what we're doing so far, PA2, PA3, we're just going to write a single thread. It's just a main program that's, that's calling other methods, but one thing is happening at a time. Right? And remember, you know, if you have a main program doing some stuff and then it makes a call to a method, that method starts executing. Your main program's kind of on hold until you get to a return statement and then this is done and you continue executing. It's still a single thread. It's just a single process. And so there's no possibility of, you know, two pieces of code trying to, to do things that contradict with each other at the same time. So this won't be an issue of concern until we deliberately try to make multi-threaded applications. But, you know, as you can imagine, if you're writing an Android app, for example, this is, this is your life, right? Because everything that you do is, is working in an environment where lots of things are happening simultaneously. And if somebody taps their screen, some code is going to run in response to that. And at the same time, there might be code running that's responding to, you know, something coming in from the radio and, and, um, and trying to, to deal with that. Python has multi-threading, but not parallel processing. Really? It's all like single process. I didn't know that. Hmm. That's surprising to me. So, so, um, yeah, we're, we're moving out of field, but that's okay. Cause it's, it's Wednesday. Um, so, so even with, um, multi threading, right. If I, if I just run the top command on my own CPU, it tells me I've got 328 processes. Four of them are running. Most of them are sleeping, but you know, it claims I have four running processes all going at the same time. On this system, that can actually happen because I have four cores in my CPU. And so, you know, the CPU percentage adds up to more than 100. It should not add up to more than 400, but it could add up to more than, than 100. But, you know, on a single core CPU, we always have a single process running at once. And so even if we created, you know, multiple processes, um, by using the threading of Java, for example, still only one thread would execute at a time. But you can still get into these kinds of, of troubles. Um, and so if, if I run, um, you know, something that's highly parallel, um, I can create multiple processes. So I've got more and more running processes kicking in. So now I've got six processes that are in the running state, but I only have four cores. And in fact, Java's taking up, you know, three of those cores plus some extra. So, so multi-processing, parallel processing, threading. Um, obviously, I'm excited to talk about that, and we'll have a good time with it in a few weeks. Um, and Java is a delight to... Um, to play with that. When you get to a university, you'll do some of this in um, C, and in C it is not a delight. So this is going to be kind of a backwards presentation where we're going to learn how to do this in Java, and it's going to be really easy and fun. You can kind of sit back and, and sip a cappuccino while you do it, and that'll be great. And then, you know, probably next year, you'll be doing this in C, and it's a whole different experience. It's like down at the metal level, dealing with bit flags and, and, and all kinds of crazy structures and so on and so forth. And, um, but we'll ease into it in this course with, um, with threads in Java. All right, um, let's see. 
Is multi-threading something mostly done automatically by compilers and interpreters these days? Good question. Um, I don't know what the state of the art is, but I feel like it's not very advanced yet. So, so the question is, you know, if you if you have a job that takes an hour to do, could you spread it across, you know, 3,600 machines and get it done in a second? Right? That's sort of the, the ideal goal. Doesn't usually work. Um, but people have studied for a really long time the question of, you know, can you have a compiler that, for example, would take a C program and figure out how to farm the work out into multiple machines or multiple cores to get faster execution of the total program. Um, and there's some things you can do, right? Certainly if, if you're writing Java and you're deliberately creating threads, you can just throw those threads on different cores. And I think that's what the JVM does kind of automatically. Um, but, but more subtly than that, you know, I'm going to have a for loop that adds up the numbers from 1 to 10, and then I'm going to have a for loop that multiplies the numbers from 20 to 40, and then I'm going to have something else that I do. Well, those first two for loops could happen in parallel, right, as long as they're using different variables. And a smart compiler might be able to, you know, compile chunks of those code, put them on separate machines, and then collect the results back and continue with the rest of the program. Um, but, but generally speaking, I don't think, you know, GCC is doing that. Um, there's probably versions of GCC with switches you could put on to, um, to compel it, to look for those opportunities, but generally not. And Java, um, you know, since you have the ability to create new threads, I think that's the main way that, that things get farmed out to, um, to multiple CPUs or cores. That's all like really, really interesting research area um, that you can get into in some of your courses down the road. All right. Um, let's see. Other questions, comments? So let's take a break. I was going to prepare some stuff before um, before class, and I didn't get around to it. So let's take um a bit of a break and come back in like seven minutes and i'll do some fast typing and gathering of code and then i want to talk about um generics and this is a good a good place to go from um from what we've been doing so i want to talk about generics and how we can create generic classes on our own um so we'll start with that so we'll come back in about seven minutes
All right, we're back. Um, let's talk about linked lists again. So, um, oh, I've been missing some, some happening chat. Yeah, Zoom is not bad. Um, I was very impressed. Most people were very impressed when we first went to um, to remote learning, and the whole country kind of went remote, more or less in the same period of a few weeks. Zoom totally like seemed to bump up their capacity, and it was pretty impressive. Um, and you know, as impressive as Google is, Google really didn't rise to the challenge, at least in my experience and the experience of other teachers I've talked to um, who were forced to use Google and it was just, you know, super laggy and um, seemed unreliable and so on. And Zoom has done an amazing job and, and you know, even though we aren't big fans of, of remote classes in general, um, I think it's been working better than than I ever expected it to. and. So yeah, Zoom seems to like be doing it right. Um, however, that is. I know you figure you figure Skype or something would have would have tried to rise the challenge, but yeah, talk about market opportunity, you know. <laughs> All right, so let's um, let's. So like Discord or something. Yeah, yeah. Um. All right, Skype used to be cool, you know, but um, yeah. So anyway, um, link lists. So um, let's go back and revisit link lists. So I, I pulled out over break some of the old code that um, that we developed in previous classes. So let me um, dust that off with a sample main class. And our goal here is to, to head towards generics. So I'm going to construct an empty link list. And I'm going to add some stuff. So I'm going to add a 10. And I'm going to add a 20, and I'm going to add a 15, and I'm going to add a negative weird number, and I'm going to add some big number. And then let's look at the list. And there's our entertainment for Wednesday afternoon. Um, Yeah, I've been doing online violin lessons through most of uh, of COVID using Skype, um, and it's it's okay. It works, except you know I run it on Windows and it blue screens every like fifth time um, that I try to use Windows. Really? But that's just the laptop. I don't think that's Skype's fault. Um, uh. All right, let's see if this compiles. Um, did not have on my list, so. Let's compile that. Let's make sure we've got our node class. Let's compile our test program. Oh, I misspelled it. All right, uppercase L, compile that, that works. Does this actually run? Boo, all right. Um, So I was a little too fast over a break trying to write this code, so or pull this code in. So let's see, we've got a um, sentinel. I'm not going to make it private. Um, I'm going to construct a node, set the data to n, set the new node to point to what the sentinel points to, set the sentinel to point to the new node. Um, the string method will set temp equal to sentinel next. 
and take the data values and append those. My list line nine. You know, next equals sentinel next. Oh, I do need a constructor. Um, Alright, I'll just be, I'm being super duper lazy in here, um, and, um, set, um, my sentinel equal to a constructed node, um, and so, so, we've got our linked list back from, from last week, right, so, um, I'm adding, um, 10, 20, 15, negative, and then big long number. And since I'm adding to the beginning, 10, 20, 15, negative, and big long number, it's acting like a stack, right? I'm adding to the beginning so I can see my numbers in reverse order. And my two string method is, is doing something really nice. Um, I can just take my linked list and append it to a string like list equals. And, and there's my, my comma separated list. All right, so so why are we redoing this? Because we've already done linked lists. Um, because because I'm going to change our linked list class, and what I'm going to do is. Um, make a linked list of strings. So we've got a linked list of integers. What if I wanted to do a linked list of strings? Well, I would want to do the same constructor, but here I would want to add some words. So I'm, I'm going to call the same add method, but I'm passing in strings instead. And then I'm going to, you know, use the two string method implicitly by appending my linked list to a string. And that, that should all work fine. Now, I can't, I can't compile this as it is because, you know, my linked list is set up to handle integers. But, um, but we can, we can fix this pretty easily. So what do I have to do to make a linked list of integers into a linked list of strings? I have to change this from int to string. And that's probably about it. I have to tell my add method that it's receiving a string named n. I have to store that in the data field of my node. My two string method is going to be exactly the same. So that's one change I have to make, right? So right here, I changed int to string. And I'm going to need to do one more thing, which is in my node class, my node still thinks the data field is supposed to be a string. So I'm going to change my node class and down here. change into string in the following line. And now everything should compile and if I run my program, bingo, I've got a linked list of strings. All right, so there's a second linked list. Now suppose I wanted to do something really bizarre and make a list link link list of rectangles. C 
So what would I be adding to my list? Instead of adding integers or rectangles, I would add something like a new rectangle. Let's add a 3x5 rectangle. And let's add a 4x7 rectangle. And let's add a 2x2 rectangle. And let's add a 1x121 rectangle. And let's add a 11x11 um, 11 11 rectangle. Right? Is this a weird thing to do? Well, maybe, but you know, maybe linked lists of rectangles are legitimate. So I haven't really changed how I'm using my linked list. I'm constructing it exactly the same way. I'm adding things using the add method. I'm going to print it out by concatenating the linked list to a string. And the argument to the add method is now, you know, rectangles, because I want a linked list of rectangles. So I'm going to have to change some code. Because obviously if I compile this, it's expecting strings now, and I'm trying to give it rectangles. So, um, so what do I have to do? Well, I have to change my node class to say, hey, this is not an int, it's not a string, it's a rectangle. And I have to change my add method to say I'm not adding a string, I'm not adding an int, I'm adding a rectangle. And my code still compiles now. And when I run it, there's my linked list. My list equals an 11 by 11 rectangle, a 121 by 1 rectangle, a 2 by 2 rectangle, a 7 by 4 rectangle, a 5 by 3 rectangle rectangle. So what's what's the the overstated point here, right? The fundamental code for a linked list doesn't really change a whole lot based on what kinds of things I'm putting into the list. Integer strings, rectangles, right? The mechanics are the same. The way that I insert in the beginning is the same. The way I convert to an output string is the same. But this, this two string is particularly cool because what am I doing here? I'm building an output string called return me, and I do that by concatenating the data field from each node. Or if that data field is an integer, it concatenates, you know, the characters that give me the decimal representation of that integer. If that data field is a string, it just concatenates a string. But if that data field is a rectangle, what does it do? It calls the toString method of the rectangle class, which prints out, you know, a height by width rectangle. Just should have had a space in the beginning, right? Um, and that, that gets used in the construction of our linked list. So this leads us to the idea of generics. Yeah, that would be cool. We could have the two-string method actually print out a little ASCII art rectangle. That would be awesome. That would be a fun test question. Um, no. So, um, so the idea of a generic is building on this this notion, right? That. Um, Sometimes we have a set of code that can work with different types of objects. And in C, we'd have, you know, int list, string list, rectangle list. And there'd be, you know, int list add, rectangle list add, uh, string list print, integer list print, and so on. There'd be these different, you know, functions with different names, depending on what type of thing they want to take. Because you can't call an add method with a string or an int or a structure, right? The compiler won't like that. You gotta say exactly what kind of thing you're trying to pass. But in Java, we can have multiple add methods with different um, different signatures. They take different arguments. But we can extend that and we can make this idea of a generic. And so let's make our linked list class generic. And honestly, I have not done this in a year, so this may blow up horribly. But let's try this. Um, so I'm going to say uh, my list 
And in the class declaration, I'm going to say, hey, I don't know what kind of object, so I'm going to re require the caller to specify a type of parameter when they construct this list. So the class my list will take a parameter t, and t will be something like integer, string, rectangle, and so on. And so I know down here that I needed to take my add method, and instead of saying int or string or rectangle, I want to use this parameter t. And so I'm going to say the type of thing that n is is just t. And now if you construct a my list with angle bracket integer, this will say integer n. If you construct with angle bracket string, this will say string n. So it's kind of like instead of passing it by what's the name, it's just passing the type. Yep, exactly. Cool. Yeah. So it, it sort of looks like a function call where we're passing a type, um, but it's also kind of like a macro substitution. If you've done number sign defines or if you did macros in 270, um, it's it's a symbolic replacement, right? Whatever we put in here basically gets lobbed in right here, and the code that gets compiled will be public void add parentheses say string space n or rectangle space n and so on. All right. So the other thing we had to do was was node, and this is also going to have to be generic. So we'll construct our node with a type t parameter. And, and we'll pass, um, we'll use t as the type of thing that the data is. And so we're going to need to do something when we construct our node. We're going to need to say, hey, construct a node with a type. Maybe it's a string, maybe it's an int, maybe it's a rectangle. What is it? It's a t, whatever t is. So this, this can look a little weird, right? This is basically an argument that we're, we're specifying. It's actually called a parameter that we're specifying when we construct or declare a my list. And then we're using that parameter as, as you know, our argument to constructing our sentinel. And we're also going to use it in our declaration of the sentinel. So my question is that where would you declare it as a string in yeah, so so in our main method, when we construct the my list, um, let's say my list rectangle. Let's do that. So now when when the my list constructor is called, it's going to get a parameter of rectangle. And so t will be RECT. This will say node angle bracket rectangle sentinel equals new node angle bracket rectangle. This will say public void add parentheses rectangle n and so on. And when I construct the rectangle, this parameter t will be RECT. And so this will say class node um, angle bracket. This will say rectangle data and then node next. This should actually be node of type T again. So let's see if this works before I tell you how fantastic it is and how great it works. Um, I knew there'd be a problem. All right. Well, this is this is yeah. This is this is a good um, a good example that I hadn't planned. Sometimes when you compile code, you get these notes, right? These are kind of like warnings. They're things that you should probably pay attention to. Um, and this is saying you're using some unchecked or unsafe operation. It's not going to bother you with all the details. It's just kind of saying, hey, you know, you're doing something that's not quite kosher. If you want more detail, you can put a switch on the compile command. And the switch is dash x lint. So lint is is kind of an old school term um, for for stuff that doesn't necessarily do any harm, but you probably want to get rid of, right? So it's you know the little fuzz ball on your sleeve that you want to kind of pick off. Is it really old school though? It goes back at least to Kernigan and Ritchie. That's where I first encountered it. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, it's still widely used, yeah, so I don't mean old school, I mean, I mean sort of, um, a term that's been around for a while. I use ESLint for JavaScript, it's, it's like, it's, it's so awesome. Yeah, right, it's, it's, so nice. it's like the grader that doesn't take off points, but gives you lots of good feedback. So there's, there's, um, lints that you can run on C programs. And it'll show you all the things that you're doing that, you know, don't even necessarily cause warnings, but could be causing problems, right? And so, like, that single equal sign business, you know, if I single equal sign zero, you can pick that up with lint sometimes. Um, so let's recompile um, with a dash x lint option. And uh, so that's not the problem. So let's recompile node. And that's happy. So recompile my list, and we've got six warnings in here, right? And the warnings are coming because I'm using node without a parameter, right? So raw type found for raw, um, and I'm missing a parameter, right? Because node is a generic. So so. Um, so that's causing, you know, a whole screen full of, of issues, um, but but not a bad problem to fix. So let's just find everywhere that we use node. And in this case, you know, we always want to um, want to specify that the type of node we're creating is a node of type T, whatever T is. Um, and so I think those are all of our cases. Um, so let's recompile. That's all fine now. So no more warnings anywhere in place. Um, that compiles just fine. Let's go ahead and run our main program. And, you know, there's our list of rectangles. All right. So let's let's take advantage of the genericness of our generic. So suppose I want my list of integers. Change this rectangle to integer. Not really, um, because we're doing two different things. Hold on, I'll come back to that in a minute, because because I have some stuff I can say about that. But let's let's um, let's embrace the glory of this first. So Java main two. Oh, I forgot to name my class. Less glory. All right, more glory. There's our linked list of integers. And all I had to do to make that happen was, you know, change this parameter here and here, and then, of course, you know, add integers instead of rectangles. All right, why do we have to specify this in both places? Um, it's really because we're doing two things, right? We're declaring a list, and then we're constructing a list. Um, now should the the compiler be smart enough to know hey list is an object of type you know my list angle bracket integer let's go ahead and call that constructor. Yeah it could do that but there may be cases where we might construct with something different from the type of thing that that we declared and this gets into like you know class extensions and and squicky stuff like that that I'm not going to really delve into in, in those dimensions. Um, but I think that's probably the reason why they give you the option of possibly having something different here from here. And so you have to put it in both places, once for the declaration, once for the construction. There are, there are aspects of, of object-oriented programming in Java, in this case, 
that I'm not going to get into, but for example, if I have a method that expects a certain type of argument, I don't always have to give it that type of argument. Sometimes I can give it an object from a different class if one of these classes is an extension of, of the other. Um, you, can, you can get into some interesting games by passing um, something that's not exactly the same class. We are going to talk about class extensions. In fact, that's coming up either later today or on Monday because we'll need that for, for some of the graphics stuff we're going to do for PA4. Um, but there's, there's, you know, all of this stuff around the subject of class extensions, and we're going to talk about a little bit of it, just the parts we need. But I think that might be related to why you put this on both sides. All right, there's our, there's our class of integers. Let's make a class of rectang of, uh, strings. There's our, our declaration and our initialization. And here we're, we're creating a, a linked list of strings and we're adding strings to it. Um, I just blew away main two, oh well. Oh, that's okay. This will be main two. Alright, linked list of strings. I'm just kind of curious now if you can make a, a linked list of strings just for fun. Of, of what? A uh, structure. Uh, what kind of structures? Oh, is that a Wait, I forgot, I think. Yeah. But I mean that is what we're doing, right? So a rectangle is basically like a structure. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a good comment though because that's that's exactly what's going on here, right? And basically any structure or class, you know, in this case that we want, we can make a linked list of those. Um, we could even make a linked list of linked lists. I believe. Um, So let's make a. Go ahead. So the recently discovered body stamps on cats, the best thing ever. Really? Cool. I always wanted to do that. I had a friend with. I had a friend with a cat. Uh, the cat's name was Laup Duez. And um, it ran away one day or disappeared one day. And about a week later, a friend of mine. Um, called me and said, hey, I think Melanie's cat is at the Indian restaurant. It was this little restaurant like five miles from town. And uh, went out and looked, and the cat was there. And um, anyway, long story short, this cat kept disappearing, but it would pop up at a neighbor's house. And my friend had moved, and the cat was going back to where he, her house had been and visiting the neighbor. And he got the trip down to about six hours to get across town. Um, and I always wanted to put a camera on it and kind of see like how it went and what it encountered on the way and how many people stopped and fed it and petted it and that kind of stuff. So I'll have to look for these these body cams at break. Yeah. I used to have a cat. It was the same type as Lop Duez, actually. It was like a Maine Coon mix. And um, sometimes this cat would come home and it would smell like a fireplace. And it's like, do you have another family you're hanging out with? <laughs> and I started to wonder, like, how many different people this cat lived with. Because it was a stray that, that, you know, I'd adopted. And I started to wonder, like, you know, do other people think this cat's stray and adopted? And so on. Um... We've got, 
Yeah, right? Well, we've got squirrels in the backyard that we feed, and every now and then I see one coming into the yard carrying a peanut, and it's like, where'd you get that? So I think they're working the whole neighborhood. Um, so we need squirrel cams. All right, so this, this should theoretically work, right? Um, I'm, I'm defining a my list that takes objects of type linked lists of integers. And I'm just going to add three empty linked lists in here. And um, let's just see if this compiles. Need parameters on the constructor. Um, and I need to import. This actually compiles. So let's let's um let's do something fun. I know it's a bit late, but maybe I should maybe I should change my SLP to that. Yeah, right. <laughs> um yeah, Maine Coons are amazing. I, I just love them, and, and I've always known, like, strays of them, and they just have, like, the sweetest personality. I've always found they adopt, like, one person, um, and it can switch over time, but they seem to, like, pick one person to, like, latch on to. Um, Alright, so now we're just playing, right? So I've created a, um, a linked list called temp. Um, I constructed it as a new linked list of integers, and I'm putting 2, 4, and 6 into it. And I'm going to add this to my my list. And now I'm going to make a new linked list called temp. So the first one I added, I added even numbers to and the second one I'm going to add consecutive integers to and put that into my list and then the third one I'm just going to add you know prime numbers of course and add that to my list and then let's print out a list and see what happens right so this is this is you know it's a, a linked list that we've constructed called my list. And the data field of each node is itself a linked list of integers. Now, if you tried to put that together in C, right, we'd be here for the next few hours probably trying to keep track of what's what. Um, but this is relatively simple to code in Java, right? I just have a linked list of integers that I'm calling temp. I can construct it. I can add stuff to it. When I'm ready to put that into the my list that I'm building called list, I just say list.add. And then I'm just going to concatenate list to a string to kind of see like what's in there. So this almost compiles, except I forgot my parentheses again because constructors need arguments. So there's that, and keep your punctuation good. So Java main four, and there's our list. All right. So something weird happened in here, right? I expected my list to contain a list of even numbers, a list of consecutive numbers, and a list of primes. It contains a list of um, even numbers, but it does not contain these other lists. So those lists came out empty. So what's going on here? Oh, 
I thought this was going to be deep, but it's simple. So I didn't add temp after I created. Okay, we'll get to the deep thing another lecture. Um, so yeah, um, create a list of integers, add these things to it, and then put that into my list. Create another list of integers, add these things to it, put that into my list, and so on and so forth. All right, so this, this will do what we expected, right? So there's a linked list containing three linked lists. List of primes, list of consecutive numbers, and a list of even numbers. All right, what I was Can going... I yeah, go ahead. Can you remind me why we're remaking temp as a new linked list? Um, we're going to keep having the same variable temp as new linked list. So suppose I didn't, I didn't do that. Suppose I just went ahead and I added this list to my list. And then I added some more things to the end of temp and added that to my list. And then I added some more things to the end of temp and added that to my list. Actually, this is, this is a perfect example of what I was hoping was about to happen before. So what happens when I run my program? I have a linked list containing three linked lists that are all identical to each other and contain evens, consecutives, and primes. So what's going on here? Temp is a linked list of integers. I add three things to it and then I put it into my linked list. So that's not a Minecraft server window. Um, so here's my linked list. It's got temp, and then it's got temp, and then it's got temp. And temp is, um, temp starts off as just an empty linked list. I add three things to it, so temp is equal to two, four, six. So it's got that. And I go ahead and I say, let's add temp to our, our my list. So I put this first node in, and then I go ahead and I add one, two, three. So temp becomes one, two, three. And I say, add that to my, my list so it goes in the beginning. And then I say, add um, seven, 11, and 13. And then add a new node to my list. Well, now this is what my list looks like. And each node is got a data value of temp, and temp is this big long linked list. And so when I when I look at the contents of my list, right, it's this less interesting uh, triple copy of a single linked list. So if I if I put a separate um, if I create a new linked list for each of these, then basically what I have is you know something like temp1, temp2, and temp3. I have three separate linked lists in my, my my list. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, well, yes, but also no, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was like, the thing is that you call it temp... It's like you're calling each node the same variable. Yes. And it kind of uh, took me off because I thought... It was What's gonna happen is that it's gonna keep getting rid of the previous linked list and replace it the whole new linked list. Because I think it's like it's like it's like in PS2 example that you want to have to, you know, mm -hmm. like on Monday I think. Yeah. So this is this is a, a really uh, potent observation, right? I'm I'm calling this the same thing, temp. I'm saying you know add temp here, add temp here, add temp here. But it's a different object because I've constructed a new linked list. This is this is identical to um, in 2.22 when we would have, um, you know, a pointer to a structure named temp, right? Anytime that we say temp equals malloc, we get a new block of memory. And if we build a linked list with basically temp pointing to temp pointing to temp, but each of those temps, you know, is is assigned a different memory location. Um, then we've got a linked list. 
where you know the code is the same thing it's it's always saying you know set set this thing next equal to temp but that value of temp changes right so this is saying set the sentinel to point to temp this is saying set the point sentinel to point to temp this is saying set the sentinel to point to temp but the thing that it's pointing to the value of temp is different because each time it's a new object it's a different object this is this is the essence of dynamic memory this is writing code where we're constructing things in memory on the fly right that's that's the big lesson of 222 this is what it looks like in java right similar concept all right got a lot of mileage out of this one example it's pretty good all right, we don't need to write generics for, for PA2 or probably for any of our assignments in this course, but if you needed to, right, that's, that's how you do it. Um, right, in the class declaration, you can specify one or more parameters separated by commas, and then just use those parameters wherever it's appropriate to use them. Um, in this case, you know, in the add method, it's, it's a way to specify the type of argument, but also you might use it in the construction of, um, of other, um, objects like nodes, for example. Just a little observation that I thought of. So, hashmap is a class, correct? Correct. And so hashmap would have two parameters that they say they both is K or V, K or mm -hmm. v, right? Yep. Is that kind of the same idea? Exactly. Okay. And so if I wanted, you know, I could make a hash map where my keys could be strings and my values could be my lists. And I could store this list that we created here associated with the word example one. And I could create a totally different my list of rectangles. Well, no, it couldn't be rectangles. But, you know, another my list of, of a linked list of integers, and I could associate that with the word example 2. And now I would have a hash map where the values were my lists, where the nodes were linked lists, where the nodes of that were integers. And you can nest this stuff more or less as deeply as you want. And, and that's good, right? Because what we're going to see when we particularly start playing with... with um, graphical interfaces making GUIs and stuff is you know we're gonna have a window and there's gonna be a button on there and that button is going to be a particular type of thing which is going to be a particular type of some other thing which is a particular type of some other thing and and we're just gonna say I want something called a J button and the J button is gonna have a method called um, you know uh, set color and I can say j button dot set color and I want to make it red well there's a class called color and there's a method in there I can use to specify intensities of red green and blue and get back a color which I can pass to the set color method of the j button class and so we're we're going to by the fourth programming assignment be working with really deeply nested um, you know objects inside other objects inside other objects and and as we get more comfortable with that right that will that will be increasingly fun um, so here's here's a preview right a java button which is a type of abstract button which is the type of component which is a container which is a component which is an object and and um, it has all of these fields from an abstract button and these fields from components and these fields from swing components and so on and so forth and it's got a few methods available to it but because a, a J button is actually an abstract button with some extra stuff we have a bunch of methods available in abstract button that we can also use and we have methods available from components and methods available from containers and other components and from objects. And all of these methods are accessible inside a J button. 
but the actual code for a J button only specifies, you know, a handful of methods. And so this is going to get us into the idea of, of class extensions. But same idea, right? Oh. If, if we want to set some property of it, it might be a property that's inside one of these other classes. Yeah, go ahead. So for the clarification, um, for that clarification, you explained it well, but I'll try to make sure I heard you correctly. Um, so, what class did that kind of extend out as far as this one goes? Mm -hmm. You can you can call methods from previous class, like mm -hmm. you can call classes from like previous. Yeah, what we call base classes. Yeah. So in other words, you don't you don't have to, if you're going further down. Aspect button, you can call methods in aspect in the aspect button class, even though you're not into that same class. Exactly, so, exactly. Kind of interesting. Yeah, and what? That, like, if you go very far down the um, class, you have access to like hundreds upon hundreds of these things. Mm hmm. And ultimately, you know, there's an equals method, which we can use on any objects to see if they're the same. There's a clone method, which we can use to make a copy of an object and so on and so forth. And ultimately what we're going to do is for example, we might create I might create something called a nick button. And it's like a a regular java swing button but it does something weird, right? And I don't have to write a lot of code to create a nick button. I can say I want to start with a j button, but I'm going to add one more method to it, which is the the, you know, twirl 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 method which makes something happen, right? Um, and this again is the idea of code reuse, right? And being able to, to, um, to build off what's already available. All right, what's going on in chat here? Correlations between programmers and cats, yes. And even having a dog and a chicken, you're still a cat owner. So that, that still works. But there's probably a, an algebra or calculus of dogs, cats, and chickens that we could create to show how they interact. Um, currently doing ODP 303. I think this is answered at the end of the chat, so I'll jump down to that. Yes, um, length without parentheses gives you the length of an array. So that's that's just um, one of these things to keep in, in mind. So if you have a string... It doesn't mention that on... So if, if word is a string, there's a method word.length. And we can do that because if we look at at um, at the string class, there's got to be a string in here I can click on, yeah. If you look at the string class, there's a method in there called equals. And so, so when you call a method, you have to put parentheses at the end of it um, to specify, hey, I'm calling a, a piece of code. But for arrays, arrays have a, um, a property called length. And so no parentheses because it's not a method. It's just a field within that class that, um, that you're calling. Yep, yeah, just like C, uh, data bracket, such and such, equals value. Okay, um, I'm doing that, and um, I'm going to add a for loop for, for each of the indexes. Mm -hmm. uh, for 303, and the assess is not having it. Right, so um, so your, your client is not producing any output. Um, which could mean that there is an issue with how it's running, but um, let me take a quick look here. Is it supposed to produce output? Uh, when it runs in the test bed, it should. Um, what for like each time my set function runs? 
No, no, your class should not produce output, but when you run the test bed, it should be producing output, and it's not for some reason. So are you assessing it exactly the same way it says to assess it in the README? Um, yes. Okay. So let's see, you're calling your set method in your constructor, which is super cool. Um, data index equals values and data index. Okay, so um, in your case also, your code looks perfect. So there's something about how you're assessing it that, that may be slightly off. Um, and I don't know what that is at the moment. Um, I should just capture commands when I run these things. Um, yeah, if you want, stick around for a couple of minutes after class if you can screen share. We can do that. Yeah, I will. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Um, questions, comments on generics or on any of this stuff? Yeah, that's my own. That's my own Bash script. Um, so I can say doc, and I can put in the name of any class in Java, and it'll it'll pull up a Firefox page with that documentation on it. Um, I can try to make that available, but it's it's not exactly ready for prime time, and if things change, it it gets wonky. But, um, but this is, this is good old bash, right? So, so, um, if you don't specify an argument, I just bring up the index page for, for the Java doc. So, you know, just doc by itself gets me the generic, um, page that's linked to and I downloaded this documentation so it's a local copy on my hard drive um, if you specify an argument I search for a slash in there right so echo it and pipe it into grep slash and if there's a slash I'm asking for a particular um, HTML page on a particular uh, path and so I can just go ahead and use that otherwise things get interesting and I basically go into the Java directory where the documentation is um, and I do a, uh, a document find command, which searches the whole tree of Java documentation for whatever keyword I put in string, link list, hash map, etc. Um, and if I find it, then I go through and I pick off each of those. I find the shortest one and I return that, um, and the doc find command is just another bash script, which basically says, you know, use the find command to search for whatever you specify dot HTML or search for what you specified or search for what you specified with any extension or search for anything followed by what you specified followed by any extension or return nothing. So I think if I say doc list, that'll bring up a list. Um, if I say doc linked, that won't bring up anything. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's it's a bunch of stuff. But but a good exercise would be to write your own version of this, and think about what makes makes it the most useful for you, and and dust off your bash skills, because bash is always good to have. Thank you. Thank you again. But I want to write this in another language, is that possible? Sure. You could write it in Java. I'll have to figure out what it acts like. It was maybe it was the application and be able to open up a website, you know. Yeah, um and we'll we'll actually um closer to the end of the course we'll talk about um another class called um 
URL. And URL is a class we can use to interact with, um, among other things, web page servers. And you can construct with a string which specifies a URL of a page that you want to access from a server. And you can you can get back the page information and and we'll tie this together with some some graphical objects and we'll be able to make a web browser in about five minutes once we know all these classes. We'll get a rudimentary web browser, including be, being able to click on hyperlinks. And then if we put in a linked list to keep track of our pages in reverse order, we can implement a back button and pop from our linked list every page that we pushed and go back to, um, to pages we previously visited. And it'll take us about five or ten minutes to do that once we get to that point and we've got all of the mechanics down. And that's, that's a really nice example of sort of the power of working with objects and being able to put these things together and so on. Yeah, I like the, I like to take, like, programming applications and, like, make it a, a kind of cool thing, like you did with the, like, what you did with the, um, the Minecraft server and you being able to press a button and it activates the command. Yeah, yeah. I saw that, I saw that video and I thought it was cool. Cool, awesome. All right, um, let's see, that's a good synopsis of generics, hopefully. Um, so where are we going from here? Um, I think what I want to do next, and we'll probably start this on Monday, um, I want to talk about something called a print writer. And we can use a scanner to read from system.in, that's standard in. We can construct a scanner with a new file with a path to read from a file, that's fine. So we can do input from, from standard in or from a file. We can do system.out.println to write to standard out. The piece that's missing is writing to a file. And so a print writer is, is a pretty simple class that we can use to send output to a file. And we'll basically construct a print writer with a file name, and then we can do uh, print writer dot print line and print into that file instead of printing to standard out. And that'll that'll sort of wrap up our our quartet of reading and writing from standard in, standard out, and reading and writing from files. And that will be um, the only missing piece for PA3, which we'll talk about on Monday. So PA2 is due Monday morning. Um, and then Monday in class, we'll talk about PA3. And for PA3, we're going to go back to binary trees, and we're going to be constructing our own binary tree. So, you know, making a node class and then making some methods. Um, but we're not going to be worrying about, um, you know, searching this tree. We're definitely not going to worry about deleting or balancing. We're mainly going to worry about um, traversing the tree and adding to the tree. And so it'll it'll be you know a simpler version of some tree code, but it's going to be a very particular type of tree called a decision tree, and we're going to use this to make a version of a game called Twenty Questions, where you basically you know think of something and then somebody gets to ask yes no questions, you answer yes no and the person tries to guess what you're thinking of. We're going to make a version in Java that will play Twenty Questions with you. So you can think of something, it will ask you yes, no questions, and try to guess what you're thinking of. And the system that we implement will actually get smarter over time. The more you play it, the better a job it will do in figuring out what you're thinking of. So that's going to be PA3. We'll talk about it in detail on Monday, um, and, um, and we'll go from there. Let's see, assess decided to work just now, don't need it after class. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, maybe there was, there was a file name issue or a protection issue or something like that, but you got it working good. You're good to go. All right. Any final questions? I'll let you out like four minutes early otherwise. Um, and we got seven people here, so thank you for being here. Um, so can you do a review on the advert thing? Because I'm, I was not inspired by what kind of what you wrote down, but I want to make sure that I understood what I want to do exactly. 
So you're looking for an overview of ad reference? Yeah, so well, I can turn it if else. You, like, you, wrote, you wrote it down, but it's an if else. So um, ad reference uh, through code. And so basically, just, and you mentioned towards doing this, but this way was check whether the words are in the list. And the variable list, that's, I can declare a list in the beginning of the class, correct? Mm -hmm. You can declare it inside the add reference method, so make it local to add reference. Oh, yeah, I probably should. I was going to make it a private, but... You can make it private, but, but generally you don't want to make too many globals in your class. The things that you make global should be things that you really need access to throughout different methods. If I want a temporary like like list here, which I'm just going to use to hold the link list, just go ahead and declare it in here linked list, angle bracket, integer, list. I'm not going to construct it because I'm not trying to make a new linked list. I simply want this variable to be equal to what I got back from, from the get method. So, you know, this is whatever my hash table is. Dot get, and I can save that in list. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Cool. Okay. I might come back with that tomorrow to just get more detail about yeah, the definitely. back to back to backbone of what I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. This is this is what does all all the actual work. Everything else is just kind of like, you know, take care of this for me, take care of that for me. This is the one that's actually like, oh I gotta actually do this. But even so, it's it's handing off a lot of work to, you know, the hash map class and the linked list class. So it's still just kind of passing the buck, which is cool. Yeah, All right, awesome. Have a great day. And um, yeah, I'll see people in office hours. Um, if not, have a great rest of the week, weekend, and see you um, Monday in class. All right, thanks. Bye.